When we look at an infant and toddler, and you're working with the little guys, now remember, developmentally, what stage of development are they in? What's infant toddler development? What's that stage of development? According to Piaget, what is that? Do you guys remember? It's the sensory motor and it's egocentric. What does that mean, egocentric? What does that mean, egocentric? What's ego mean? Self. Centric. Oh, the center of the world. Oh, okay. What's the two-year-old creed? It's mine. It's me. It's about what I want. It's mine. If you saw it, it's still mine. If I put it down, it's still mine. It's all egocentric. And that is developmentally where they are, right? So what do we concentrate on with that age? One of the first things we talk about is share. What does Robert Fulgham says? The first thing you learn, share everything. We share. So if you're talking about sharing, where would that fall in here? Where would sharing fall? in the social-emotional domain? If the uh, building relationships and possibly uh -huh. self-regulation. It actually kind of falls into everything, doesn't it? That's why sharing is number one, according to Robert Fulgham's poem. It's number one, to share everything, because it addresses everything. Share building relationships. Oh my gosh, if I have to share, I have to build a relationship with somebody else, don't I? I have to self-regulate if I want to share. Oh my gosh, you guys, you guys, you don't want to share. When we're, you know, road rage, we're on the road, we're driving along, I'm not sharing my lane. I'm not letting you in. Uh, I think we need to go back and look at self-regulation and sharing. Everybody needs to... You know, you notice that even the billboards that said share the road, they're talking about cars and bikes and pedestrians. Isn't it amazing how that word share is actually a major part of our life and the social emotional domain addresses that, okay? When you're talking about the difference between the social emotional domain, according to the foundations in Macy, and you're talking about the social study standards for K1 and 2. Do you think there's a connection between these two? Do you see anything over here with these big fancy words? Big fancy words. But are they really saying any of this? Do you see a connection? What do you see? Uh, individuals, groups, groups and institutions. Okay, what do you think they're talking about there? Talking about, that'd be like the building relationships and sense of self, conflict resolution. Conflict resolution, oh my gosh, when we talk about peace treaties, mm -hmm. we talk about global relations and we talk about what we're, what's going on in the government in terms of peace treaties, are we talking about conflict resolution, okay? So when you teach a two-year-old to say share, you think maybe we need to tell some of our world leaders that? Let's go back to the sandbox people. Let's go back to the foundations. Let's go back to early childhood, okay? So yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. What else do you see where you think it probably relates to over here? What else? Anything else jump out at you? Individual development and identity. Okay, what do you think that relates to? Sense of self mostly. Yeah, well, look at the word, individual identity. What do you think they're talking about there? A sense of self, who you are, where you belong. One of the things that we talk about with a, with a little toddler, little toddler, two-year-old, one of the first questions we say is, are you a boy or a girl? Now, now, as adults, we have big discussions about gender identity, mm -hmm. okay? And how gender identity is a big social topic. 
social studies. But when you go back into the sense of self, even when they're tiny, they're starting to get a sense of identity about who they are. Where do they belong? Where do they come from? Okay, who's my mom and dad? Where do I live? All those kind of things. Do you see anything else that you think might be related? <coughs> what do you think? You're looking at it, you're seeing it. You know it. I see the look on your face. You're like, I know that. Oh, I know it is. I know it is. Which one are you looking at? Uh, power, authority. Power, authority, and governance. Okay. I'm the teacher, I'm the boss, I get to set the rules. Does that work in early childhood? No. <laughs> you have control issues, you don't belong in this field, right? Because, think about what Erickson says. In Erickson's stages of development, the second stage of development is autonomy versus shame and doubt. Mm -hmm. Autonomy. <clears throat> that sense of I'm learning how to be independent. I'm learning how to go out and do it myself. But there's authority out there. Am I doing it right? So even when they're very, very young, they get a sense that there's this conflict between I want to do what I want to do. It's mine. But there are rules. Do we learn rules? Is that a social skill? Okay. So you're trying to learn how to be rules. You're egocentric in your sense of development. And you have to get this idea that, oh, it's about other people too. Remember how I said threes are my favorite age? Because they get this sense of wonder that there's this whole world out there beyond themselves. And suddenly it's just like magical. Mm -hmm. But it's also... What are the rules in this world out there? What do I need to do? What do I need to learn? And we get that sense of social emotional sense in early childhood, okay? And it all goes back to self-regulation. We don't like to follow the rules, do we? We're from Bloomington, we're rebels, right? We're rebels. It's in our nature, right? But it really is about self-regulation and about giving yourself the ability to take that internal pause and to think about all of these other social rules that we focus on in early childhood. And it all goes back to those stages of development. Think about Erickson's stages of development and how they progress through those stages of self-regulation and the understanding of rules then that's the connection. Now, you get into these higher age brackets, K through two, and suddenly we start calling them something else. If you were to ask a kindergartner, okay, we're gonna learn about production, distribution, and consumption. <laughs> what do you think they do? They get that deer in the headlights look? Okay. Okay, but if you went up to a kindergartner and you said, okay, we're going to talk about classroom chores and, and who wants to sign up to take care of the pets? Does that have to do with distribution of labor? Does that have to do with production? So when you assign a classroom task to a child and say, let's clean up. We're going to take care of our stuff. Okay. Are we addressing this area? So do you see how in the younger ages, we're addressing it in a very individual, okay, very individualized, egocentric way. And then we're expanding it into the outer world according to where they are developmentally. That's the difference between these two. You guys have any questions? Social studies is fun, okay? I think it's fascinating to see how children 
progress in their understanding of their social skills. Okay. Um, okay, when do we all learn to go to the bathroom together? <laughs> We're pretty young, aren't we? Why do we do that? You ever wonder why we do that? Okay, what is it about that social connection that we make even when we're very, very young? Okay, um, two-year-olds and three-year-olds in terms of play development are, even, are, are progressing from parallel play where they're playing next to each other to associative play where they're interacting with each other, right? And when they start to interact with each other and they start to realize where they are in that social pecking order, then you get, you get to come to my birthday party. But you don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is that realistic? At about what age do they start doing that? Think about that. At about what age do they start to do that? Where they begin to be I want a birthday party and I want to invite so and so, but I don't want to invite that other person. When do they start doing that? They become aware of the world, they become aware of the social structure, and they start to internalize the power of that structure. They start to internalize the rules. And what's our response to one to what, what what's what's a response that a teacher or parent would make where you get to come but you don't? What would you say? No, why do we say no? Because what, what, what does law, what does Fulgrim say? Okay. Say you're sorry if you hurt somebody. Okay. Um, share it, play fair. Play fair, that's number two on the list. Play fair. Is it playing fair to say you can come but you can't? Okay. That's why you always invite whole class. Yeah. You know, do you guys ever watch, uh, ever read the uh, For Better or For Worse cartoon? Yes. You do? Okay. Isn't it hilarious? They just went through this thing where the little girl had to send out um, Valentine's, mm -hmm. had to send out Valentine's to everybody in the class, and she didn't want to send a Valentine to this one person. Okay. And her mom is like, you need to do that. And she's like, but why? but why she's stuck up, she doesn't like me. And so she doesn't send her a valentine, but the other girl sends her one and now she feels terrible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Life's lessons. Okay. Now, when you look at the difference between these two and you're thinking about how that will look in the classroom, okay, you're really looking at some really distinct changes in terms of cognition, right? Look at the language of this, and then look at the language of this. Okay, this is very internalized. This is externalized, okay? This is application to the larger world because in terms of cognition, there is a big big jump between, you got to remember, this is pre-operational concrete. You're starting to get into concrete operational here where they are beginning to understand abstract concepts. So when you write lesson plans, when you think about what you're going to do in the classroom to teach these concepts, it will change because of that difference in cognition. So what would it look like in the classroom? Let's make it real. If you wanted to do a lesson plan that addressed building relationships, now you were able to identify commonalities, how some of these also related to building relationships, but how would it look in the classroom? What would it look like in, say, an infant toddler room? If you're building relationships, what do you think that would look like for an infant? Little, little infant, building relationships, okay, what would that look like? Okay, babies, think about the first stage of Erickson's development, trust versus mistrust. 
What's that baby doing in the first few months of life? It's bonding with its caregivers, right? Okay, is that baby building a relationship? Okay, you're addressing that stage of trust versus mistrust. So if you were to work on building the relationship of an infant with a caregiver or with a teacher, what would it look like in the classroom? What could you do? What would that look like? Lots of one-on-one -on -one time. Lots of one-on-one -on -one time, that's good. Okay. Because at this stage, you know, they're, they're so dependent on you. But that, I mean, they're, they're so full of trust. And they are dependent on you. And they want you and they need you and that's why they cry. <laughs> right? They want you. They, they, they cry for a lot of reasons. But there is a real sense of that bond in which they want you and they need you. And so they're building that relationship with them. What can you do one-on-one -on -one with an infant that would help build that relationship? You can read to them. Okay, so you could design a lesson plan for an infant that has to do with reading to them or even singing to them. Okay, or just talking to them. Does that address their social emotional skills? Mm -hmm. Does that address one of the topics within the social emotional domain? Is it for an infant? You can do social studies with infants. Oh my gosh. Isn't that amazing? People think you can't do anything with babies, but you can. Okay, what would it look like <coughs> sense of self. Now, babies are so interesting. The sense of, you know, this is a sense of self to a baby. They spend 45 minutes doing this. Right? I'm going to look at my hand for 45 minutes. And as teachers, you have to sit there with them as they look at their hand for 45 minutes. <laughs> right? Because that's their sense of self. And they're exploring. When babies are first discovering their sense of self and they're looking at their hand, what do they do next? They look at you and you might hold up your hand. Touch your hand. Okay, and then the baby will look at their hand. And they'll look at your hand. <laughs> Okay, you're building relationships, but there's also that sense of self. They're starting to identify, wow, this is me. This is who I am. So what could you do? You could play patty cake with an infant. Patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. Okay, and you're identifying sense of self. Two-year-olds. <laughs> when you can catch them. These two-year-olds are always running away from you. They're running away from you. I'm going to go find myself right now. <laughs> They're running around. They're going to go find themselves. Great thing, sense of self. They're starting to discover, okay, I'm a girl, you're a boy. What's the difference? <laughs> oh, that's the difference. Okay. Wow, I'm taller than you. And they'll go up and they'll look at each other. No, I'm taller than you. Okay. They'll begin to identify body parts. Here's one that you can do with a two-year-old. If you have the energy, I'm old. It's so hard for me to do this now. I don't have the energy. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. You guys know that? Mm -hmm. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. What are you doing when you sing that with them? Helping, what are you doing? You're helping them identify what parts they have. Yeah, you're identifying body parts. There's a certain cognition to that. You're learning language. You're learning that the name for this is a hand, and the name for that is a foot, okay? And the name for this is a head. And you can talk about the vocabulary, and you can talk about the cognition of that, but in terms of the social-emotional do domain, they're also discovering a sense of self. They're discovering what makes me, me, what makes me up. I have brown hair. Why do I have brown hair and my mommy's hair is different? Okay, 
why do I have red hair and you have brown hair? They begin to notice differences because that has to do with the understanding of self. And then you can begin to build on that vocabulary. Okay? What would conflict resolution look like to a four year old? What would that look like? We think about four year olds. Okay? You're coming to my birthday party. Let's not invite her. We won't invite her. Come on, let's go over here. We're going to keep all the dolls to ourselves over here. We're not going to let her play. Mystery <laughs> so they're not letting me play with the dolls. <laughs> well, I think you need to go talk to them about that. Let's go talk to them about that. So what would that conflict resolution look like? What would it look like? What do we do? One of the first things that we do to promote conflict resolution. If you stand over in the corner and go, ah, what do we do? We say, what's the magic word? Use your words. You need to tell me. You need to use your words. Because that also encourages self-regulation, doesn't it? Okay. Calm down, <coughs> use your words. Okay, we're gonna talk about this, okay? Now we're gonna go talk with it over here and have a friendship meeting. And why won't you let her play with the dollies? Because they're yours. Are they all yours or do they belong to the whole class? You're <laughs> <laughs> <We're> stubborn. <laughs> Okay, but that's an example of conflict resolution. That is what happens in an early childhood for this age. So as teachers, what's our role? What's our role as teachers? It's to <coughs> facilitate that conflict resolution. We give them the time and the space to do that conflict resolution. We talk about having friendship meetings. We talk about these concepts of sharing and play fair, which are abstract concepts, and by definition are difficult to understand in that pre-operational concrete stage. And so as teachers, we try to facilitate those abstract concepts by instituting rules. Well, I know that's how you feel, but what's the rule? The rule is to share, the rule is that the dolls belong to everybody, right? That's how we do it. If you were in first grade, and you were on the playground, and you wanted to swing, you wanted to swing on the swings, and the swings are full, what do you do? What do you do? Do you go push somebody off the swing? <laughs> you're not, you're, <laughs> you're a bad girl. <laughs> that's what you do, huh? No, you get in trouble for that because that's against the rules.